spirit crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed so there was much much joy in that city this is the word of the lord let us pray shall we what a mighty god thou art heaven and earth adore you angels bow before you what a gracious god thou art it is an act of your graciousness that you have the word of god at our disposals lord we ask that you will open up this word to all of us this morning and that the entrance of it may give us illumination and transformation restrain the hand of satan that your word may have freedom among your people. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you bring utterance and understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. May you return to your seat. We saw the end of Stephen at the end of chapter 7. Stephen died. Stephen was killed by a murderous mob. And chapter 8 opened to us an introduction to the man Saul of Tarsus. The martyrdom of Stephen was in divine providence the making of Saul. The end of Stephen was the beginning of the rise of Saul. And you can see this dual reality of how God acts in this portion of the scripture. As the church were being destroyed in Jerusalem, expansion of the churches around the world began. Because what Saul was doing with his people to see an end to the church was an impossible task. You cannot destroy that which cannot be destroyed. The church is the body of Christ. There is no amount of force. There's no amount of persecution that can destroy the church. Christ himself said... I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. There is no prevailing power known to man that can stop the movement of the gospel. So in God's sovereignty, the persecution of the church in Jerusalem opened the door, opened the frontiers of uh, the, the, the boundary of the Samaritans and the Gentiles that were locked hitherto. And the quick lesson we can learn, like what verse 4 is showing us, is as these men were being scattered, they went about preaching the word. The scattering of the people of God was the scattering of the seeds of the gospel. Uh, they scattered the individual believers in Jerusalem. The seeds of the word of God were being thrown around uh, the, the, the nations of the earth. You, if you've grown up in the rural areas and you know what hunting looked like, you know, sometimes there is fire in a particular area, and then out of your childishness, you pick up that bunch of fire and then you throw it away. And then you see that the, the, the pieces of the, the, not the flames, the, the charcoal, they start spreading again. And then there will be much, much fire, you know, in the final analysis. That's what was happening here. No, that's what was happening here. And my friends, if I can bring quick application, it is always normative that God will bring out his glory in the darkest of human circumstances. God will have the final word in every case. God cannot be beaten in his own game. 
God is the ruler of nations. God is the ruler of the earth. There is nothing you can do to God. There is nothing you can do to his people. The physical persecutions is just but, in fact, an advantage in the final analysis for the propagation of the gospel as it has come to happen here in this uh, passage. So the, 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 they were going house to house to arrest people. I think we are familiar with that now in the country. I learned people were being arrested from house to house. Some of you that were posting things on X, you know. They were, I'm, I'm happy nobody has been picked. Maybe, <laughs> I'm not even sure. Maybe by tomorrow we'll take census who have been picked already from this, our own environment that have been busy on the on X. Saul so, uh, going from house to house, picking on uh, believers, women and men. Except the apostles that remain in Jerusalem, almost everyone were all over the place. And then, and as, as they went out, they were preaching the gospel. As they went out, they were not lamenting. As they went out, they were not groaning. They were preaching the word of God. What a beautiful example of Christians. Wherever Christians go, what you find on their lips is the word of grace. And Philip is one of the examples of how these were demonstrated at this time. And the movement of Philip now to Samaria is part of the confirmation of Jesus' prophecy that the disciples who preach the gospel from where? Jerusalem, then to Judea, and then to Samaria, and then to the uttermost part of the world. Now the gospel has, is going through the Judean countryside, and Philip by sheer providence, is now thrown into where he will not go ordinarily. It's now in Samaria, the city, the capital city of, uh, or, 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 or of those who are called the Samaritans. And there are a few things I want us to uh, learn about this uh, gospel in Samaria. And the first thing is that the gospel, anywhere the gospel goes, the gospel bring people together. The, the gospel bring people together. It unites the people. And, and look at verse 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. You know, it is in chapter 4 of the book of John that we saw the Lord happen to find himself in Samaria. And the disciples, when they came back and they saw the Lord talking with the Samaritan woman, they were surprised because the Bible says the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. They were enemies. The city of Samaria was actually founded officially by Omri. Omri is the father, was the father of uh, King Ahab. The story is found in 1 Kings chapter 16. When the Ten northern Israel uh, went away from the southern Israel. They formed their own nation, and I think Jeroboam was the first uh, king of that part of uh, division. And uh, they, they don't have any capital. There was no serious capital. I think Jeroboam was in Shechem, ruling from his own community. And then later, the capital was in Tiza. It was when Omri became king, O-M-R-I, Omri became king, that he bought the field, he bought the mountain, the hill country of Samaria, and made that uh, the capital city. And for a long while, the nation of Israel, the northern Israel, Ephraim, dwelled, their, country, their capital was in Samaria. And I will recall that in 2 Kings chapter 16, chapter 17 particularly, there was an issue. In 722 BC, uh, the king of Assyria came and invaded that community, that path of Israel, as a judgment over their idolatrous living. And he conquered Israel, killed many of them, and took some of them into captivity. Almost all of them he put into, took into captivity and recolonized and repopulated Samaria with foreigners. 
uh, and then those foreigners settled down in Samaria. I'm just giving this story to let you know that Samaria was not a gentle city. Samaritans are not Gentiles. It's just that in the estimation of Jewish people, Samaritans are worse than Gentiles. And that's what I'm trying to build up. In fact, in, in Mishnah, if as a Jewish person in the morning you are traveling and you happen to meet a Samaritan on the road, you go back. Your, your body has been defined. Just, just by, so if you notice a Samaritan like far away, as far as your eyes can see, jump into the forest. Because if by any chance you just pass, it, there's no greeting anyway, just by passing a Samaritan, you are defiled for 24 hours. It was that bad. So those unbelievers came to settle down in Samaria, in the land of Israel, and they brought in their gods and their worship. And the Bible says in 2 Kings 16, 17, that because these guys don't even know the God of Israel, as they were worshiping other gods, God sent lions to, to kill them. And they were destroyed by lions, some of them. And then they consulted oracles. And oracle says, Ifa, Ifa says, ah, go and bring priests of the Lord. If not, this thing will not end. So they went and brought back some Levites and some Israeli to live among the people so they can worship God. And that was the beginning of actual... Uh, syncretism in the land of Israel, like in terms of formal syncretism. So the worship of Yahweh and the worship of other gods were merged. And then they began to intermarry. And over time, the rest of the Jewish people began to abhor the Samaritan because of their intermarriage. Now the seed is no longer pure. And there's a theology to that. Every Jewish person knows that God is preserving the seed of Jacob for the Messiah to come. The Messiah shall come through the line of David. So every, any attempt to contaminate the seed royal are kind of prevented. So there were, okay, these guys are no longer part of us. They are being contaminated and they are not a uh, part of us. Another sin that they committed that made them more abhorrent to the Israelis, other part of Israel was that Around 422, they built their own temple on Mount uh, Gerizim. So they no longer go to Jerusalem to worship because they will not even allow them to worship God in Jerusalem. So they don't build their own temple on Mount Gerizim. And you remember when um, Joshua was Joshua was given the blessings and the cast. This Joshua, yes, and, and they will stand on Mount Gerizim, and the other mount was. Uh, uh, Mount Gerizim on one side and then Zion on the other side. The blessings were read out from Mount Zion and the curse was read from Mount Gerizim. So by putting another temple on Mount Gerizim, they, they, they've added to their iniquity. And much more than that is that at a particular point in the history of the Samaritan, they repudiated the entire Old Testament and stayed with the Pentateuch. So the five, they believed that the five book of Moses is the only book that they will hold there. The remaining part of the book of the Old Testament, the Samaritans are refused. So all these things put together make their iniquity very, very serious. Very, very serious. And in the estimation of the children of Israel, they are not worthy to receive any mercy from God. The hostility was mutual. They don't like Israel, and Israel don't like them either. I can see that in the New Testament. But now that the Lord has opened this door to them, it, it, what, God, what the gospel is doing is that these, these boundaries, <clears throat> this wall, this division between Jews and the Samaritan is being uh, healed. It's being healed. And Philip appeared on the scene. And, and because my brothers and sisters, sin divides, the gospel unites. The gospel is a message of the love of God in Jesus Christ to fallen sinful human race. Christ had been to Samaria earlier and preached the gospel to them. They too were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for the Messiah because the promise of the Messiah was in the Pentateuch. So they were waiting for the Messiah. That's why the, the woman caught the woman at the well asked Jesus if he is the Messiah to come. And he said he is the one. 
Now that Philip had come, the reintegration and the reintroduction of the gospel to the, Samar uh, to the Samaritans were apt and timely. And then they receive the word of Philip. Because these people that were rejected by the, by the rest of the Jewish people saw the authentication of the presence of God among them by way of signs and wonder. So when they heard and saw the sign that he did, unclean spirit, just as in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the book of Mark and all the four gospels, and in the days of the apostles and the, the beautiful gate, unclean spirits were jumping out of people. They were crying out with a loud voice. They came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Notice the word paralyzed. Remember how Christ healed the paralytic in the book of Mark? So there was, as, as it were, that Christ himself had come to them through the hand of evangelist Philip, who was not even an apostle, who was but a deacon, a servant of, uh, uh, of the church, of the church. And Philip came to Samaria, preached to these people, and as, as we are going to see much, much later, they too received the gift of the Holy Spirit, just as the apostles received the gift of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. And it, 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 is, it was a wonderful scene to behold. And I, 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 I don't know how Philip was feeling that these Samaritans now have received the gospel the same way they have received the gospel. And that Jesus is saving the Samaritan the same way he has saved the Jews. And this is, it, it is Paul, Apostle Paul, that captured this very clearly in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 15. Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 15. And see how the entrance of the gospel to hostile environment bring about unity. Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 15. Let me read from verse 14. For he himself, Christ, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophet Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the spirit, the prophecy of Christ, the, the expectation of the gospel is being fulfilled here in the city of Samaria. The Lord is bringing together all his sheep, all his children who are scattered around the world together by the instrument of the gospel in Christ Jesus. So that the wall of hostility, the wall of division, the ethnic, ethnic divisions and tribal divisions and preferences and all the sinfulness of men were being handled and killed by the entrance of the gospel. And the reason why this point is quite key is that it is ignorance for the Jewish people to think that the Samaritans were the only sinners and they were not. In the eyes of the Jewish people, they have circumcision. They have the law and they have the temple at their disposals. So whatever they continue to do with their own bodies, 
were irrelevant. They are accusing the Samaritans of idolatry. But guess who are more idolatrous? Guess who are doing the same thing? Oh, in the days of Solomon, the King Solomon, there was an erection of a temple to Baal by at the corner of the temple. All the kings of Judah, all the almost all of them, with, without with the exception of Josiah, and maybe one or maybe Hezekiah, were deep into idolatry. They were worshiping Jehovah with one hand, and they were serving idols with the other hand. It's just that, it's just that, sin is blindness. The sins of the Samaritans, in their own estimation, is bigger than their own. And they, they, they reckon that the Samaritans were not worthy of the blessings of God. And the gospel is pointing to these two categories of, of looking at things that both Jews and Gentiles and Samaritans were all sinners before God. And there is only one medicine and remedy for sin. It's Christ Jesus. It's Christ Jesus. The sin of the Jewish people with their circumcision and temple and prophet and everything is sin nevertheless. And in this church, we will repeat it again and again in your hearing. The sins that Christians commit is what? Eh? Is it holy sin? Is it, is, it, is it holy sin? In fact, thank you, Ma. The sins that Christians commit are, are proper sin. Because the sin committed under the light of the gospel is grievous. And you cannot hide behind the scripture, behind what they call hyper grace, behind Calvinism, behind whatever name you want to hide behind, and said, well, we are much better. You know, the Pharisees, the snippet of how this philosophy works is this. There was a day a Pharisee and uh, a tax collector came to the temple to pray. And look at the content of the prayer of the Pharisee. He said, Lord, I thank you. That's the first. He said, Lord, I thank you. The second line is this, that I am not like other people. And he said, I pay my tithes. I fast three times a week. He said, even like this task collector, I am not like him. Oh, what a way of looking at things. Who, who, how dare you think that you are better? Huh? What, what, what is the issue of better? Better than? Do you think this kingdom is a group of those who are better than one another? You know, nobody is better than anybody here in this, in this life. All sin are sin, properly so. So that the Samaritans are doing some stuff. Of course, it was wrong. The Samaritans, what they were doing by building a second temple on Mount Gerizim, they were sacrificing all kinds of things in that temple. They were having their own priests around that region as a direct response, as a protest to Jerusalem was wrong. It was never designed by God for his people to have two centers of worship. They're wrong. And for Israel to bar them from coming to Jerusalem to worship God was also wrong. You will recall, my friends, that the Israelites will bring in the proselytes. They will go out of their way to convert Gentiles. And once they circumcise them, they will bring them to the temple. But the Samaritans, even if they were circumcised, they will still not come to the temple. Because the Samaritan sin is bigger than their own. And that's what the gospel is curing. That in the new community that God is forming, that God has formed in his son, every single person, both the rich and the poor, they have and they have not, recognize that we are all fellow citizens in this kingdom. Because we are all both fellows in sinfulness. We are here, all of us this morning, sinners saved by what? By grace. By grace. 
The route to the kingdom of God is through Christ and through Christ alone. Through Christ and through Christ alone. The gospel brings people together. We are one. Just as we were one in our sinfulness, we become one in our righteousness. The righteousness that Christ imputes to all those who come to him is but one. There's one righteousness, there's one baptism, there's one Lord, there's one kingdom of God, there's one scripture, there's one church, Catholic, universal. And when we gather like this this morning, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there is no rich man, there is no poor man. That's the reason why there's no seat in this front for, for rich people. Do, do, I don't know what I would do. If the devil choose to worship here this morning, and do where will you keep him? Back or front? You'll be shaking, sir. <laughs> of course, if the devil walks into this church this morning, it is proper to give him a proper seat, isn't it? Because that is not being partial. That's another word for another day. In Christ, the wall of hostility, who is better than one person, who is better than one person, disappears. Because God is building one community in himself. He has broken down the wall of hostility. The gospel, when he went to Samaria, when the gospel went to Samaria, he brings people, he brought people together. The gospel always, always brings people together. Look around this morning. There are, this is Benue. This is Abia State. Look at them. This is Kogi. This is Ekiti. Just, just here. Just here. And they are not fighting each other, are we? It's the gospel. All of them were sinners. All of them sinners. Saved by grace. In the second place, the gospel, the gospel breaks the head of Satan, breaks the kingdom of Satan. The gospel brings people together. The gospel breaks the kingdom of Satan. Look at this. Verse 6 again, and the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. They came to listen to the word of God when they heard him and also saw the signs that he did. The unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them in a genuine way. Okay, in a genuine way. And many who were paralyzed properly paralyzed. I'm saying it because of our context. They were really paralyzed. They were not paid paralytic people. They were paralyzed. Lame, properly lame. They were not, they were just lame. They were all healed. They were all healed. They were all healed. And there's always a nexus. There's always a connection. Anywhere on clean spirit is mentioned with physical, uh, physical ailments. Ailments. And when the gospel came to this community, as the word of God comes through the mouth of Philip, there was an authentication of that word by signs and miracles. And let me explain why that is necessary. The rule of the game of the Old Testament period is that if a man is a man of God, there should be a sign. You cannot just walk and say, I'm a man of God. If you are a prophet, the sign of the prophet is that if he speaks, that word follows. And he will not turn them back to idolatry. So, so there were signs. So Moses had a sign to authenticate him as the deliverer of the people. Those signs were not just games. The signs that he performed in Egypt were not power play to show who get Utumokopas. It was a God-given sign to prove to the Israelites that this man does have God's signature upon him to deliver you from Egypt to Canaan. This, and these things are epochal. And then when Jesus Christ came here on the earth to authenticate him as the Messiah, he performed some miracle that no other person can and ever could perform, like walking on the sea like healing the paralytic without any gymnastic. Just say, son, 
your sin is forgiven you. Uh, stand up. And the guy just stood up. One day he was walking by the pool of, Beth uh, of uh, uh, Bethesda. And then he looked, well, I said, do you want to be healed? He said, I said, okay, stand up. And the guy just stand up and just started walking. One day he saw uh, in Nain, a woman was about to bury his uh, son. And he touched the casket. And the boy just, there's not like a prayer warriors. Can you come around? Can you come around this casket? Can you give me oil? Just, just, just with, with ease. With ease. And that's why the condemnation of Jewish people for the rejection of Christ is proper. Because the signs that was performed among them was enormous. It was overwhelming. And Jesus himself pronounced curse on Israel. He said, if the signs that were done in you were to be done in Sodom and Gomorrah, were to be done in Tyre and Sidon, Ah, they will have repented long. No, they will be done in, in Sodom and Gomorrah. They have repented long ago in or in Nineveh. So there were signs of authentication. And then Christ now had these four twelve apostles that he said to open up the gospel and to plant churches. He gave them the signs of the apostles. So these signs of the apostles were being performed by the apostles, and in this instance, as by apostles associate if up to this moment signs were performed only by the apostles it is stephen and philip that we saw were performing signs and wonders as apostles associates it was not an all commerce uh, affair it is an authentication principle that follows the preaching of the gospel when the church were in his uh, infancy i shall return to this later uh, in it is in, in his in infancy and this miracle drew them. Of course, it will. Miracles always draw. Miracles always draw people. They, they, it, it drew them to Philip. And Philip preached the word of God to them. And then many of them give, gave heed to the word of Philip. And they were saved. It was not the miracles that saved them. It is the word of Christ that Philip preached. That Jesus alone saves. That God Reconciling men back to himself in the death and resurrection of Christ that saved these people. The miracle were an authentication. The miracle were a sign. There were a sign uh, that Christ, that the kingdom of God had come among men. And as Philip preached, Satan began to pack his property from this community. Next time you're going to see, there's one man. Because this is an introduction. You know, the way Luke is building his, his argument, you know, like a movie. You remember how chapter 7 is, and where we are is walking our mind towards who? Paul. Now, this, this portion is telling you that there's a man called Simon who is going to be saved later. Uh, who is a sorcerer. Uh, in, in a community of sorcery, there were a lot of lame people, paralyzed people, blind people, and demon possessed. What do you expect? Well, uh, there's a, a place where sorceries are. Uh, people were possessed of the devil, and he rooted them out of that community. He, 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 he exorcised those demons and healed those who were sick, and the word of God gained prominence among uh, the people. The entrance. A, there was a commentator that said the word of God, the Christianity, Christianity is not only it's not always about let me it's, it said Christianity is not has always not be about words only. It comes with power. A, it comes with power. Okay, it comes with power. Talk it cheap. It wherever the gospel goes, it is not it can never be ineffective. No way. Oh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For the gospel is the dynamis of God unto salvation. Anywhere the gospel go, there is the power of God following it. It's not about words. I'll mention that in my application. In the third place, the gospel always comes. The gospel brings joy to the people bring joy to the people. Verse 8, so there was much 
great joy in that city. The gospel always comes with joy. And this joy is in contrast to what we know as happiness, you know, which is just a sociological issue. Happiness is just a response to what had happened to you, what we have, what we things that happen around you. Joy is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Joy is, is a condition of the soul. Joy is a right disposition of those whose sin have been forgiven. The theology of joy can be, can be explored over and over again across the scripture. When David was praying to God in Psalm 51 after the issue with Bathsheba, what, what, was the, what was at the heart of his prayer? What was at the heart of his prayer? When he said, uh, create in me a clean heart, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. And he said, restore to me what? The joy of thy salvation. The moment the sinfulness of the people were handled and Satan power were restrained, joy blossomed in that city. It shows that before now, before now, what happens in Samaria, what usually happens, is one point of happiness here and there, and just, you know what they call suffering and smiling? How many of you know that thing called suffering, the way we are right now? I, I, I'm wondering, why are we even smiling? In, you, you go, we are moving around. You are buying fuel at a particular price, and then you are smiling. And then we should be buying handkerchief in this, we should be crying. Hmm? Okay. You, you, there's, there's a way you can just pretend that you are fine. Yeah. So whatever had happened in Samaria was a pretension, have joy or happiness. The real joy had come to these people. There's a song we sing during Christmas, joy to the world, your king has come. The gospel brings pure joy, pure joy. Riches, wealth can, can cause some bit of happiness once in a while. I mean, I've been there. You know, I mean, if you know, if you, some of you have built house before or you've moved to a new apartment and then you are laboring to furnish it, you buy bed, you buy chairs, you buy TV, plasma, you buy all of the assets, and then you sleep and wake up the following morning. Then what happened after that? Finished. Finished. You don't finish now. Do you sleep in all the rooms? Some of you have not even turned your TV on since you bought it. But the day you were looking for money to buy that, it's as if you don't buy that TV, heaven will collapse. Now it's hanging there on the wall. You can't subscribe. <laughs> it, it comes and go. Our marriages don't, marriages don't provide joy. All those, it comes and go. But the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. Because a man that is not saved, it's not joyful. God is angry. I'm quoting Psalm 11. God is angry with sinners. How many times? Every day. The wrath of God is sitting upon sinners. The hostility also is mutual. God hates sinners and sinners hates God. So on a daily basis, you wake up to, to insult, you know, remember Goliath and... Uh, Israel. They say he will wake up in the morning. His job is to go and insult uh, Israel. That is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So we, we wake up every day to this hostility. And in an attempt to produce counterfeit joy, we put things around us. The example of the Samaritans is that woman that was found at the well. How many husbands? Many husbands. Many husbands. It was when she met Christ that real joy, real deliverance came to her. Now that the gospel, the real gospel, the authentic gospel had come to this city, there was much joy. There was great joy in this city. Oh, Satan, I, Satan was mesmerized. Satan was like, what had happened to me? And people were delivered from a heart of sorcery. And it is my own prayer that one of these days, yeah, God will begin to deal with sorcery in our country. I mean, I think we are under spell. We, are under spell. we need to do something about, about it. So the gospel, the gospel brings people together. 
it unites us in Christ Jesus. The gospel breaks the head of the serpent. It breaks Satan's kingdom. It bruises his head. The gospel brings joy when it comes. When it comes. So the question is, is that normative? Is that normative? Is it, is, Pastor, is it true that this happens all the time? The answer is yes. Yes, yes. yes. If the gospel comes to a community, the only division we are going to see is the division between those who believe and the unbelievers. It is that your father, who is not a believer, will send you packing from his house. And that one is expected. But it is not possible for those who are now in Christ to be divided against uh, each other. If there is division, it's not from the gospel, it's from us. Whatever the gospel goes, there will be a diminished power of sin. The power of sin, the power of Satan will be greatly diminished, if not eradicated. And also it brings joy. All of you that are Christians know what I'm talking about. You know about joy. You know joy. You know joy. You also know about the downfall of Satan. There's a song to sing, I have seen the downfall of Satan. Glory be to God. Maybe to Jesus. Every believer has seen the downfall of Satan. And every believer knows what it means to be in the community of those who are not your class. And then you are joyful and united to them. Just quick points and then I will be out of uh, your way. Wow. Last time when I was preaching, the, when Ananias and Sapphira died, and the question I posed was that, why are we not seeing that in our church today? And I quoted a commentator who says, the reason why people are no longer dying in our church is that maybe God has reduced the quality of his, of his presence among us. And that if God is really among us, if God is really among us in his fullness, we should be seeing some terrible thing happen among his people. Hmm? I says there's a possibility that God, by his mercy, makes sure that he's, he will not come upon us in his anger because of the work of, uh, of Christ and so on and so forth. You know, so when we, when we see the way in the days of the gospel now in our time, the divisions among fellow Christians, how do we account for the division across the denominational uh, line and still ethnicity? There are some congregations you come that you see clear ethnic domination, isn't it? Son of colonialism. If the church is planted by, by a particular person from a particular side of a country, all the bishops under that person, maybe 80% will be from his own tribal people and his family members. And if you are not from that majority, and this is a cross board, you will be disadvantaged. Uh, the reason for all of these divisions we see here, it's not the fault of the gospel. There are two reasons. It is either the gospel has not been preached properly among us. And I'm saying this with carefulness. Most of us, many of us, had never heard the gospel preached in its purity. Many of us became Christian because we were told that come to church, the altars of your father shall be broken. Your money, your bank accounts. And they say, well, if, if being a Christian will give me money, wealth, prosperity, and security, why not? Let me try. And then we come to church with our own baggages, with expectations that the Bible does not promise us. And then we are still in our sin. And to that we must repent. We, it's not a gospel. We can't run back to the Bible to explain our lack of love for one another. It is that we've not been, maybe we've not heard the gospel well, or we've not been discipled enough to understand the extent of the gospel. The gospel unites us together. Even with unbelievers, see what the gospel does. 
our disposition to unbelievers from this point is not even it's not it's not even that of hostility. It is that of a way of winning them over to Christ. Turn to Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five. And I will read from verse 18. From verse 18, chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So we do not, as it were, even though we hate what unbelievers practice, but we pray, we desire that they come to Christ. We go after them with the message of Christ, the message of reconciliation. And there's nothing like, I will not preach to these people. They are not my people. There's nothing like, and up to now, to our shame, there are some ethnic groups that we don't think Christ can save. For some of you believe some politicians cannot be saved. Everyone can be saved. And we should be taking the gospel out and push the frontiers of darkness backward. And as we are doing so, in this season, the church will be packed with poor people, with rich people, with Fulani people, with Hausa people, with Igbo people, with former Egbesu member, with former Eye member, with former, former this, former that, former that. So that on a Sunday morning, you sit and then you shake hands and say, this man used to be an uh, OPC uh, uh, a member, and you're not going to oh, 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 shake. And then you sit in church. This man here used to be a drug addict. See what God has done. And then you sit in church, you look around. A great prostitute that used to be in zone four is now in church. And we should take the gospel to everywhere. When we do this, all God's children scattered around these whole places comes as a way of harvest to the church. We should be desiring to see that happening always among us. There should be no ethnic wahala. In the, ethnicity should be the last thing that should be heard in the church. Class, caste system should be the last thing that should be a problem in the church. That you are driving this, you are driving that, that you have this, that you have that, that you don't have this. Should not be an issue at all. A taxi driver, a paper seller, and then a CEO of a company can lock hands together, can eat together, can hug each other together, can even marry each other. Because all of these things will be tested. Hmm? Something live in Metama and earn one billion naira monthly. And then he believes in Jesus Christ until his daughter wants to marry a granite farmer. They are saying, though, even though the Bible says <laughs> in church there's no Jew or Gentiles, wisdom is profitable to direct. <laughs> and I had this conversation with my mom one time and my dad. Both my dad was a pastor, was a pastor, was a pastor. The issue of intertribal marriage. And they held me down. They say it should not happen in their family. I say why? Uh, my father said, yeah, the Bible says in, 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 in the Lord, there's no Greek, there's no Jew, there's no this. He said, but, you know, he said, but. He said, have you ever seen a goat want to marry an elephant? He said, you know, chicken married, he said, he said chicken married chicken, Goat marry goat, sheep marry sheep. Huh, I, said, I never, that's, that's a remark. You know? <laughs> I never saw that, that was deep. And I 
I said that, who, who are the goats? <laughs> and then the conversation, he said, he said, I should leave his presence. I'm not a wise child. And then the rest is, uh, is uh, history. That should be the last problem. The problem we should all attack is sin. Forget about uh, my own people. And it's still happening. Election time now. Some of you here. Your ethnicity comes back. Come back. The second point of application is that the Christianity changes everything. everything. The issue of miracles and signs and wonders accompanying the gospel is, a, is an issue of debate that I want to go into it as come to the end of my sermon. But is it not true that any time the gospel comes to a country and a community properly, things change? From the day of Christ, the world has never remained the same. There is a book that Someone gave, some, someone gave some of us recently called How Christianity Changed the World. If you want to read it, I can borrow you one. And the guy mentioned some areas. It is through the advancement of the gospel that women's freedom and dignity was recovered. It is through the advancement of Christianity and the gospel that sexual morality was elevated. It is true the advancement of Christianity that the issue of charity and compassion became a state an official position. It is through the gospel that the issue of hospitals and haircut care came to be. Education, labor and economy and freedom or market freedom, science, liberty and justice, abolition of slavery, art, music, you can point to the gospel. You can point always to the gospel. And Nigeria is a classical example. Go and ask your father, how, how were we what, when, before, the, before Christianity came? No, people say, oh, in the days of our forefathers, which forefathers? You were barbarians. Or your people who just wait for one year, say, let's, let's go and invade the Jebu people and collect their, their land. Then in Jebu, go wait for another thing. Let's go and invade the uh, uh, We're savages. Kingdoms, we just, we're just going around. Moving around, killing ourselves. Oh, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. There was a time, was it in Scotland? I don't know, I forgot the name of this guy that worked so much that in a particular town, the entire beer, uh, beer palace pub closed down because of the gospel. That's John Wesley. Yes, in his days. The gospel is powerful. I mean, I'm from this middle belt part of Nigeria. Before the white missionary came, more, almost maybe a quarter of the population were dying of leprosy. There were leprosy all around this middle belt area and in the north of Nigeria, the northwest of Nigeria. It was the missionaries. The, the Paul said, the gospel is not in words only, but in power and in the demonstration of power. Sometimes our lack of power find comfort with our theology. And we push this issue to, yeah, miracle and science were apostolic science. I mean, I agree 100% with that position. But John Stott says, it's an argument from silence, isn't it? <laughs> silence. At least Stephen and Philip proves that it is not only the apostles that were preaching with power. And there's a reason why some other believers that were preaching were not so much highlighted. Because it is possible to preach without power. And I challenge all of us today. And don't also go and look for power just to fall people down. The greatest power that the gospel brings to bear upon people is their victory over sin and Satan. If that is not seen among God's people, the gospel and the kingdom of God has not yet come. It has not yet come, either in your life or in the community. If the gospel has come to Nigeria, to our city, we should be seeing a greater number of reversals of ills in our society. 
It is a shame, rather, my brothers, that we are having this gospel so cold in our land and bad things are on the rise. We should contend for the gospel, for the pure gospel over our people. We should beware of preaching that is just word intellectual only, that is void of power. The gospel is the power of God. And we should be asking ourselves again and again, where is the power of God as of old? And as I close, the gospel brings joy. Have you known the joy that the gospel brings? Or the joy you are having, the quietness you are having is, is the silence of the graveyard. The gospel, no, the gospel is, 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 is pure joy. And I'm inviting those who are not Christians among us to taste and see that the Lord is good. And brothers, if you claim to be a Christian and there is no joy, there is turmoil, there is war going on, raging in your heart, it's an opportunity to check. It is an opportunity to check whether you are really in the faith. And there's only one way out of it, to run to Christ, to cling to Christ today. There's a song we sing, run to the cross, the burden will fall. Run to the cross, the burden will fall. What drugs cannot do, what regiments of all means cannot do, Christ can do and do to the uttermost. Pure joy is in Christ. What shall you profit a man if he gain the whole world? Outside Christ is enmity, is hostility. There is no joy outside Christ. There's no joy in alcohol. There's no joy in bars. There's no joy in Lagos Street. It is only in Christ. There's no joy in positions. There's no joy in houses and material things. It is in Christ alone that our joy and our hope is found. Christians are joyful people. And anytime you come to their community, and they are full of sadness and gloom. You must question the kind of preaching. You must question the kind of Christ that they have come to know. Christians are joyful people. Trust me. Christians are joyful people. And I pray that you will know what that joy looks like in your own life before you die. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will bring this reality to bear upon our hearts that we will know of the uniting power of the gospel, that we will know the, the Satan-breaking power of the gospel, and that we will know the joy that comes with the gospel, that we will know the forgiveness of sin that comes with the gospel, and the joy that comes as a consequence of the forgiveness of our sins. And that together we will rush out to preach to those who are far off and those who are near. And bring all to the harvest in your kingdom. Oh, do so and move our hearts to win all those who are outside of you to be back in your house again. In Jesus' name, amen.